Over the last four years or so, we've seen a number of young people, same age as you folks that are visiting with us tonight. A lot of people say God has been doing things among the you know 18 to 30 year olds across the country it seems and it's been no different here in San Antonio. We have seen the Lord working and uh, one of the things that has become apparent to me that some of these some of these new converts, some of these new Christians, they're they're all of a sudden coming into a measure of spiritual warfare that I think when they were first saved they never anticipated. And I've heard veteran Christians talk about the fact that they came into the kingdom and they just thought it was going to be, you know, eternal fillings of the Spirit and joy and flowery beds of ease. The Christian life is a battle. And the text, the springboard text that we've been dealing with for probably the last two months or so, comes out of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. And I, I want to hit that text just as we get started this, this evening. 1 Peter 2, 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, reading from the ESV, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. There are passions of the flesh that wage war. That means there are, there are passions that would seek to wage war and destroy your soul. We have dealt with pride. We have dealt with worldliness. And tonight, we are going to start probably three messages, this being the first, on sexual sin. Now, I'll tell you this. The very nature of the subject that I want to start dealing with tonight, I don't know the background of the visitors. I, I, you know, I, know, I know what you folks are accustomed to. To hearing that um, that are part of the church, I I don't have any intention tonight to try to awe you with provocative language. But I want to tell you this: I want to be just dead honest with you. And to do that, I I don't know. I don't you know I don't know what churches you guys go to. I don't know what kind of pastors you have. But sexual sin is a real deal. Sexual immorality, sexual temptation, it is huge in our day. And it's not a subject that we want to stay quiet about. It wages war. In fact, among young people, this one takes people down. And these passions wage war against your soul and they mean to undo you. They mean... I know I'm personifying them. I'm making them out like an enemy that actually has arms and legs and thinks. But that's the way the Bible says. That's the way the Bible speaks about them. That's the way Peter's speaking about it. It is actually a passion. I realize these are passions that are within us, but they seek to destroy. They are against your soul. They do battle against your soul. Something that wars against your soul means to destroy your soul. These are soul-destroying passions. And if they get you, you die. You die in your sin. You go to hell. That's just as real as that Scripture. Now, I, we're going we're gonna to look at a number of these. So I want to speak honestly to you tonight. Not graphically, but honestly. And so, um, our series comes from this text in 1 Peter 2.11. The verses I want to deal with most specifically tonight come from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So if you would turn there. 1 I just want these verses here to speak to us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read verses 3 through 8. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. The sanctification specifically that He's speaking about, the will of God specifically that He's speaking about, is that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger of all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God who gives His Holy Spirit to you. Now you can see it. The words I want to deal with tonight are found right there at the beginning of verse 5. Not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Passion of lust. Peter says, passions of the flesh wage war against us. Here's one of these passions of the flesh. The passion of lust. Now, just these, these verses, verses 3 through 8, I want you to help me define what passion of the lust, what is the passion of lust based on these verses. Tell me, as we seek to establish a definition, you tell me what is true of passion, the passion of lust based on these verses. Lust. What's true of sexual lust? The passion of lust based on... What, what's Paul say here? What's he telling the Thessalonians? What's true of it? If we're seeking a definition... Uncontrol. Uncontrol. There's a thing. See, he sets, he sets this passion of lust, which he accuses the Gentiles of being guilty of, over against control. So, it's losing control in a sexual way. What I mean, basically control has the idea of keeping myself within bounds, keeping myself constrained, keeping myself from overstepping. Or he actually uses the word transgress. Tra to transgress means to step over. There's a boundary there. Control keeps me within the boundary. I lose control. I go out of it. What else does it tell us? That you don't know God. You don't know God. Let me tell you, this world gone crazy after sex, this, this is one of, one of the key characteristics of the lost world. This is an evidence you don't know God. Now listen, if that surprises you, it should not if you know your Bibles. Again, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, he says, don't be deceived. And the first thing he deals with, fornicators, adulterers, sexual immoral, homosexuals, impure, they do not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And he, you know why he says don't be deceived? We've got spiritual people running all over the place that think, well, I go to church, I own a Bible, and all the time that Bible they own is telling them, if you're involved in sexual immorality, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. What else does it tell us is true about the passion of lust? It's being out of control. This regards God. It's a disregard of God. Can I tell you what the real issue is? Those who are given to the passion of lust have no regard for God. That's basically it. What's something else that's true there? The Lord will avenge. The Lord will avenge. Anything else? Defraud your brothers. Defraud a brother. Definitely a sin against others. 
Let me tell you two words that nobody's thrown out yet. Holiness and honor. And the passion of lust is contrary to both. Honor. When a young man, young woman, doesn't matter if they're young or older, but I'll tell you this. When sexual passions are given over to, it is a complete dishonoring. It's no regard, as we've already heard, there's no regard for God, but there is total dishonor. Listen, ladies. You know what a man's saying to you who wants to have sex with you but does not want to marry you? He's saying... I want to use your body for my own gratification, but I don't want you. I don't want all of you. I don't want a commitment with you. I just want to gratify myself with you. It's not really you I want, and you can't get around that reality. A man who will not make a covenant commitment to you, but wants pleasure with you, he doesn't love you. He dishonors you. His, his motives are totally impure and dishonorable. He doesn't really want you. He, he will tell you he does. But then ladies, you dishonor yourselves because you're willing to give Him your body for the sake of that pleasure in the hopes of satisfying your own emotional desires. Your own desire to be loved. Your own desire for affection. And you just cheapen that whole thing. And the thing is, He'll tell you anything that, you, that He thinks you want to hear to get you to where you're going to be willing to go that way. It's totally dishonorable. It's totally the opposite of holiness. Holiness is a people set apart. It is God setting apart a people, Jesus setting apart a people, a people of His own, who are dedicated to good and to good works, to purity, to being set apart for Him. So it's dishonorable. It is a disregard for God. I'll tell you, this is right where it's at. People who give way to their sexual lusts, they totally disregard God. And you know, don't think, boy, there is such a prevalent thinking, well, the Lord knows I love her. Or the Lord knows we're in love. The Lord knows we mean to get married. Have you never read Ephesians chapter 5 or Colossians chapter 3? It says, for these things the wrath of God is coming. This is not a thing he's pleased with. He designed marriage to be a picture of his son and his son's relationship to the church. And when you defile it, it is such a thing that brings wrath from him that he will destroy you. That's why Paul is saying he is an avenger. What does avenger mean? It means he's going to bring punishment. He does not take kindly to it. He does not say, well, I understand, ladies, that you're seeking affection. Or I understand, men, you just need an outlet. That's not what he says. It's a lack of control. It's a disregard for God. It is a dishonoring of our bodies. Brethren, it's a serious thing. It is a serious thing. And I'll tell you this. It is not just the act. Now hear me very well. And listen, I want you all to hear me. Because what I'm about to say, some of you are no doubt going to misunderstand and misinterpret. But I want to show you that I, what I'm saying comes straight from the Bible. Jesus said it. So I don't want anybody going out of here today and saying, well, I don't believe what that guy believes. I, I don't know why we came to this study. Because I, I, look, I'm not here to set any agenda of my own. I want you to hear what the Lord says. The Lord says in Matthew chapter 5, 
And, you, and you, if you have your Bibles, you should look at this. This is serious stuff. Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. You see, brethren, when, it, when I say that this is a disregard for God, and Paul says... People who are given to these passions like this know not God. He's not just saying, well, you see, the Gentiles don't know God and this characterizes their life and so when you do this, you're just acting like them. He's saying if you do this and you're given to this, you are one of them. That's why he's saying God is an avenger. He's coming for you. This is serious. And Jesus says it's not only the act. Now listen to this. Matthew 5, 28. I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay. So what? Everybody does that. I mean, I talk to all these professing Christians around me, and I know they struggle with it, and so we all struggle with it. After all, oh, wretched man that I am, and the things I want to do, I, don't, I just can't find myself doing them, and the evil I don't want to do is what I find myself doing, and I look around and I see all these folks around me, and they struggle with the same thing, so certainly it must be okay with all of us. Have you never read, Jesus said, few there be that find it? The broad way is the religious way. Just because you may sit in a church where you've got a bunch of other people that fail and fall to the same thing doesn't make you safe. You're only safe when you're in a category where Jesus says you're safe. And Jesus does not say if that's true in your life, you're safe. Listen, numbers don't bring safety. Truth brings safety. What God says in His Word is where you want to stand. You'll easily go to hell with the crowd if you think numbers bring safety. Jesus said, many are going to say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, and He's going to say, I never knew you. So don't trust in the numbers when Jesus Himself says many. The crowds, folks, in that day are going to find out Jesus never knew them. Sexual, listen, let me tell you this, where you are with sexual passions has literally everything to say about whether your Christianity is true or not. Jesus says you've committed adultery in your heart if you've only had lustful thoughts, lustful intents. Now listen to what he says right after. He's talking about a man using his eyes to look at a woman and lust. And then he says immediately, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Let me tell you what Jesus is saying. And you can't twist these words to mean anything else. If you are involved in sexual sin, internet pornography, illicit sexual immorality, Jesus says you cut it off or you will go to hell. This is life and death. You say, wait, wait a second. What is this? I thought we were saved by faith. Oh, you better believe we are. But if your faith is such a faith that does not produce the kind of hand cutting off, eye gouging out, foot cutting off Christianity, then it is not a faith that will save you. No way, no how. That's what Jesus is saying in all this. Listen to this. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, it is better for you that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. And of course, he's speaking 
illustratively here. He's saying that thing in your life that causes you to stumble, you need to get rid of it. Forsake it. Repent of it. Cut it off no matter how radical it is. You need to get rid of it. And if your faith is not capable of that, it is not a faith that's going to save you. Listen, have you never read? James says the demons believe. But they're not saved. Faith that does not produce an all-out battle against sexual immorality is a faith that will not save you. And I have that on the authority of the Word of God. Like I say, I, don't, I haven't come here tonight to set forth my own opinions in this matter. This is exactly what Jesus says. Jesus says heaven and hell are at stake. Listen, if you've got the kind of faith that allows you to go on list, looking at internet pornography, being involved in masturbation and all sorts of sexually illicit things, We've got any young men, young ladies here living in sexual immorality and you're claiming to be a Christian? You need to go back to the beginning. You need to start all over. You need to repent from the beginning. You need to turn from it. You need to cry out to Christ to save you from your wickedness, save you from your sin, save you. Heaven and hell are at stake. Isn't that exactly what Peter's telling us? These things wage war against the soul. Heaven and hell are at stake. And unless your faith is able to take you through this battle, and battle saving faith is sin killing faith, saving faith is lust killing faith, saving faith is warring faith. Make no mistake about it. Let's not mince words. This is what Scripture says. These things wage war against your soul. In other words, if you cave to them, if you give place to them, if you don't fight, gouge out, cut off, do battle, all out battle, not your own power. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That comes right out of Romans 8.13. Life and death. You will live if by the Spirit you put these to death. I want to be honest with you. I don't want there to be anybody here, any young people here, any older people here. You're involved in sexual immorality. And it may just be up here. Your mind is full of perversity. You think sexually illicit, profane thoughts, unholy thoughts. Your eyes are where they ought not to be all the time. You have struggles and you can't overcome. Listen, Jesus says, or Paul said this, Romans 6.14, He said, Sin shall not have dominion over you if you're under grace, not under the law. If you've truly been saved by grace, sin will no longer have dominion. Let me tell you this. <coughs> Sinners, I mean wicked ones, full of all sorts of sexual immorality, all sorts of perversity. They can come to Christ and find full and abundant pardon. Yes. It is called justification. The sinner comes with a horrible guilty record. And God washes that record clean by faith. But let me tell you something. If your idea about being saved stops there, you've got it wrong. Because wherever God comes in and justifies a guilty sinner, pardons them by the blood of Christ and the work of atonement that Christ did on that cross, He will also break the dominion of sin. This is the greatest outward manifestation to whether you've truly been justified. Here's the thing. I can't see your spiritual record. 
I don't know if it's clean. You don't see mine. I don't know if you're forgiven. It's not stamped on my forehead or on yours. See, this is what the Bible says. Don't be deceived. Many are deceived. What are they deceived about? Oh, you got people all over the place. Well, I believe. I said the sinner's prayer. I walked the aisle. I went to the altar. I had that experience at camp one time. I did this. I did that. I read my Bible. I went to church. And the Bible the whole time is saying, if your life is not radically transformed where the power of sin is broken, don't be deceived. The reality of a clean record is not there if there is not indication of a transformed heart. Unless your approach to sex has at some point become radically changed, unless your uncleanness and impurity at some point, I mean practically speaking, has not radically been altered and the power of sin broken, don't be deceived. Don't Look, the legal reckoning has not taken place unless practically your life has been transformed by the power of God. So evident in Scripture. Just listen to this. Romans 8.13 says this, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. You say, what's it mean to live according to the flesh? Well, in Galatians 5.19, Paul says the works of the flesh are evident. What's the first one in the list? Sexual immorality. What's the second one? Impurity. Third one, sensuality. I mean, the first three hit right at the heart of this. And he says this, if you live according to that, you will die. But somebody's going to come along and say, yeah, but I was saved by faith. What are you saying now? If I fall into the sexual sin, I lose my salvation? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying your salvation was never real in the beginning. I'm saying it wasn't true. I'm saying whatever you thought it was, it was not biblical salvation. Listen, many people come to Jesus on Judgment Day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? And he says, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness or workers of iniquity. You see, if the power of lawlessness and the power of iniquity was never broken in your life, it's the greatest testimony Jesus never knew you. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit Oh, not in your own strength, but in the power of the cross, the power of the Spirit of God unleashed by faith in Christ. If by that supernatural transforming, regenerating, bringing from death to life kind of power, if by that power you put these things to death. Listen, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying the first day you truly believe that there is never a struggle, never a temptation, and never a battle. Listen, when it says they wage war against you, what it means is from the first day to the last on this earth. You are in all-out battle against it. You are gouging. You are killing. You are waging war. You are putting to death by the power of the Spirit. It's all-out battle. Some, so look, some people misunderstand and they say, oh, so when you become a Christian, basically, sin no longer has dominion. In other words, it all just stops. No, when it says it doesn't have dominion, it means it won't dominate you. It doesn't mean it won't wage war against you and you'll have to fight for everything you're worth in the power of the Spirit. No, it'll be all out. Will we fall? There will be days you'll fall. But it's war. And you will gain ground. You, will, you may come upon the battlefield and you may fall. 
but you're going to take the field. You're going to move forward. You're going to advance. There, that sin cannot dominate you. You will move forward. There's no such thing as saving faith, true faith, God-given faith, real get-me-to-heaven faith that does not wage all-out battle against the passion of lust. And listen, in the power of the cross, there is power to overcome. There is. It is not a hopeless battle. But if you're in chains, you've just never been able to break away. No matter what has happened, you just find yourself a slave. Slaves of sin are not slaves of Christ. Call upon the Lord while He may be found. There is power there. There is sin-killing power to be cured. Folks, what I'm saying is this. This battle is not optional. And there are a lot of folks today... You know what? There's a lot of folks today that basically think this. Well, hey, all I've got to do is believe and I'm in. As far as my sanctification, well, that's kind of optional. You know, the more good I do, the more reward I'll get. But after all, I was saved by faith. So yeah, I'm still sleeping with my boyfriend, but you can't judge me. Judge not, lest you be judged. Oh no, Jesus can judge you. And God is the avenger, and He will avenge against you. And when He says that those that are given to the passions of lust know not God, when Jesus says it's better you gouge out an eye than you land yourself in hell, they can say that. They are in the place to judge that. And that's exactly what they say. You don't want to play games here. You don't want to play any games. This battle is not optional. Listen, mark it down. There is no faith that saves from God's wrath if it does not save you from the power of sexual immorality. Mark it down. The sexually immoral know not God. Listen. Listen to me very carefully here. Because this is the heart of the matter. The sexually immoral know not God. That's what Paul said there in 1 Thessalonians 4. Did he not? Did you guys see that? They know not God. You say, well, I know about God. No, that's not what it says. It doesn't say that they don't know about God. It says they don't know God. There's a big difference. Jesus said in Matthew 7, when they said, Lord, 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 He said, I never knew you. Jesus knew all about them because He calls them lawless. He knew all about them. He didn't know them. You say, what's the difference? Oh, to know about somebody is to know facts. To know in the biblical sense Adam knew Eve and she conceived. Very intimate. When Jesus knows somebody, remember Ephesians 5. When He knows somebody, that's His bride. That's His church. That's His body. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He knows the church intimately. They know not God. It means they have no intimacy. They disregard Him. They dishonor Him. 
They don't know Him. Those of you that know your Bibles, in Matthew 13, verse 44, you know what you have a picture of there? A man who's walking through a field and he finds a treasure that is so valuable that he goes and he sells all that he has that he might have that treasure. Can I tell you what this knowing is all about? It's when a man comes to know that he has discovered a treasure that is worth more than anything else. And he doesn't disregard it. He knows. He's convinced. I want this more than anything else. You see, when a guy comes along and he's willing to dishonor a young lady, disregard God, he has never found... It's one of the greatest indications he's never found Christ to be more valuable than anything else. You know what happens to a person who finds Christ and knows... I mean, he sees and knows what he's found for real. He will go and sell all, including his sexual immorality. He will say, I want that more than I want that girl. I want that more than sexual pleasure. I want that. Listen, there's, and just mark this down, there is a big difference between the passion of lust and sexual desire. Sexual desire channeled into the marriage bed is honorable. We're talking about that which is immoral. And a man will set aside all that disregards Christ when he finds Christ to be more beautiful. Listen, this is the heart of the matter. When a man or a woman, when they find Christ, when they see in Him glory and beauty, when they say, yes, I want that more than anything else, and I don't want to do anything that grieves Him. I don't want to do anything that separates Yes, I have sexual desire, but my desire for Him is more. And so, I'm going to stay controlled. Lord, help me to stay controlled. I don't want to dishonor You, and I don't want to do anything that breaks my fellowship with You. I have found You to be altogether lovely. And my heart wants You. It yearns for You. It calls to You. My heart, I want to go hard after God. I want to find You. I want to meet with You. I want to live my life for You. I want to... I want, you are my all. And I am willing to sell all to have You. When it says they know not God, it means they've never come there. If your Christianity has not made you fall in love with Jesus Christ, you don't know Him and He doesn't know you. That doesn't mean things are hopeless. That just means what you have is not the real thing. Oh, when a man finds Christ to be the treasure of all treasures, he will not hold on to anything else. Listen, when somebody falls in love with Christ, the fear of hell is a very real fear and Jesus appeals to it. It's better for you to amputate than to wind up in hell. But when you come to know Christ and know Him intimately and to fall in love with Him, the greatest grief is not the terror of hell. The greatest grief becomes offending the one you love, falling out of fellowship with Christ, having Him withdraw, having Him not smile on you anymore, offending Him. Oh, brethren, how many of us, once God saved us, we stumbled into some sexual immorality and the greatest grief was not, oh no, now I'm going to go to hell. The tears ran because we knew we offended the Lord. After everything He's done for us on that cross, after everything He's endured, 
The Son of God was acquainted with grief and affliction on my behalf. And here I went and did this. We hang our head in sorrow because of His great love for us and the fact that we would count His love as such a cheap thing and do this. Oh, if you know Christ, I mean, if you deeply know Christ, you know God, you love God, you have found the glory of God just shines in the face of Jesus Christ. And you've once looked at that and said, yes, yes, that's what I want. It's not a light matter sit down in front of a computer and masturbate in front of pornography. It's hard for a man to do that when he's thinking, how can I, how can I go into the secret place tonight and commune with Christ? He won't be there after I've done this. It doesn't become a light matter. I'm telling you, this is the real deal. And if the faith you have doesn't produce this, it's not worth having. It isn't. It's all out battle. All out battle because of the one we love. All out battle. Because we no longer disregard God, we have regard for Him. We have regard for His laws. We have regard for the way He's made us. We have, regard, we have regard for sex. It's good within the confines of the marriage bed. And outside of that, it's defiled. Totally perversion of how God designed it to be. Well, this is our first visit to this subject. And I think this is the heart of the matter. All right, we're going to be doing a sermon request this morning. Uh, you can turn in your Bible a while to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I had a sister ask if I could do a sermon on the subject of fornication because it is a very big problem right now among the professing Christian youth. And uh, we're going to see some of those statistics today in this study. Uh, but just a little, another little prophecy update. I had a brother from Texas write to me and he said about a mega church. I don't remember if he said it was in his area or some place that he had heard of, but they actually have opened an official Starbucks coffee house in their church. Now think about what that means. A secular company coming into a quote-unquote church. What's going on? Well, corporations are joining hands to make money. Don't tell me Starbucks said, oh, we'll put a, a coffee house in your church so that we can you know, bring people in so they can get saved. It's not what it's about. It's about money. Okay? <laughs> the churches are just going to keep getting more and more corrupt. But anyhow, let's, let's start out here. Uh, I'm going to read Webster's 1828 Dictionary for Fornication. Because this word unfortunately, has fallen from common usage among modern professing Christians. And I'm going to show you why in just a little bit. Fornication. There's four different definitions that they have listed here. Number one, the incontinence or lewdness of unmarried persons, male or female, also the criminal conversation of a married man with an unmarried woman. Number two, adultery. Matthew chapter 5. That's a neat thing about Webster's 1828 Dictionary. It'll actually give scripture references. Number 3, incest. 1 Corinthians 5. And number 4, idolatry, a forsaking of the true God and worshiping of idols. And now we're, that's spiritual fornication. There is the fourth definition, and that's definitely in the Bible. We're not going to talk about spiritual fornication today. We're going to talk about the act of premarital sex, or extramarital sex, we'll say. And I'm going to be very blunt today, by the way, too. All right, I'm not going to try to sugarcoat things. I'm just going to come right out with it. I'm not going to be crude or lewd or anything. I'm just going to be blunt. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Now, if you know the your Bible, the most carnal church uh, in your New Testament is the church at Corinth. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers, abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So you see there the group fornicators and idolaters and or, adulterers. There. And then effeminate's the next one. <clears throat> okay, God does not want men acting like women. All right, you say you should be in touch with your feminine side. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it's not there. And you say, oh boy, that's really bad then. You know, if, if you've done that in your past, well then I guess that's you're in real trouble with the Lord. Now keep reading. Verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I don't really care what a Christian has done in their past. Okay? If you have committed the sin of fornication, God can forgive you for that sin. Alright? Right there says so. Such were some of you. And notice it doesn't just say, you know, that they committed it once. These people were committing it perpetually. But when they got saved, they stopped. It doesn't say such are some of you. It says such were some of you. Don't think that you can continue in sin and that God's just going to say, I ah, don't worry about it. All right? He can forgive you. You're not going to lose your salvation if you are a fornicating Christian, but you will never inherit the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God in your Bible is spiritual fellowship. First and foremost, it's spiritual fellowship between you and the Lord. But secondly, the kingdom of God is the millennial kingdom. And if you think that your millennial inheritance doesn't matter, you're going to have to think about that. That's a thousand years. And if you don't have any inheritance at that time point, some people say they'll, you'll stay up in heaven. Uh, others say you might come down to the earth, but you really won't get to rule or reign or anything. Maybe you'll just clean toilets or something for a thousand years. <laughs> I don't know. But the point is, it's a very big deal. You're, you're not to live in those sins that are listed up there in verses 9 and 10, but you can be forgiven. So if you've done this sin of fornication in your past, and you've been saved since then, you've confessed it, you've forsaked it, you forsook it, excuse me, and you've moved forward, don't worry about it. Because you fall into verse 11 there. Such were some of you, but now ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified. So, if you've done it in the past, don't worry about it. This sermon's not directed mainly at you, it's directed at those that are continually doing it. Look at verse 12. We're going to see why fornication is a sin here. It says here, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised us, God hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Don't even... Get tempted with it. Flee it. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now I know how young people are, and they'll say, well, it's my body, it's my decision. No, it isn't. If you're saved, it's not your body anymore. You do not have the right to do what you want with your own body. You have to do what the Lord tells you to do. You are his bondservant. You are bought with a price. You say, well, what, how did he buy me? With his blood. Acts chapter 20 verse 28 talks about you are purchased with the blood of God. You know. But uh, you see there, 
that when you commit fornication, you are actually sinning against your own soul or against your own flesh. Why? Well, because you are becoming one flesh with whoever you're doing that with. The act of sex is reserved for marriage. And we're going to see here as we continue in this study that actually in the Bible that the consummation of a marriage is the act of intimacy. I'll, I'll be a little bit nicer there. Intimacy is what makes a marriage, what finalizes that union. So when you're just flippantly just doing that and, you know, and just, oh, it's just casual sex. No, it isn't. You are actually, in a way, getting married to somebody like that. And the bad thing is, if they are a fornicator, they're connected to other people, and they're connected to other people, and they're connected to other people, and pretty soon, you know, you're connected to an awful lot of people. And that's a bad thing. And, you know, I don't get into a lot of the charismatic stuff of, you know, having to cast out devils and all this other stuff. Um, <clears throat> certainly, I do think that there are people that are possessed and all that. I'm not saying that. But there was a guy I read the one time, and he was saying about that you actually develop sort of a soul tie when you are fornicating with people and i do believe there's probably a little bit of truth to that you're becoming one flesh with them but you're also tying yourself to them spiritually that's a very bad thing you say what's the solution <clears throat> well first corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 now con concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me it is good for a man not to touch a woman nevertheless to avoid fornication let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband you know, there's a thing uh, among some Christians they say about this purity pledge or something like that. And I've known people that have done this, that they are involved in a courtship and then they are getting you know, engaged to be married and they say, we're not going to even kiss until our wedding day. You say, well, that sounds kind of prudish and whatever. Well, I think it's a good idea because it can lead to something. And, and, you know, I heard a guy preach on this the one time and he said, God designed it for a man and a woman when they start to kiss that the passion starts to flare up and it's supposed to lead to the next level, which is totally fine in a marriage. But when young people are doing that with no intention of getting married, it is leading in that direction. And to have to try and shut that off is very hard. Okay, it's very difficult. And a lot of teenagers today in Christian youth groups are kissing and then it's starting to lead into that other area. And we're going to see some statistics here. Well, actually, right now I'm going to read you some statistics. This is just incredible. Is fornication a problem for today's professing Christian youth? Well, according to an October 13th, 2011 article, excuse me, it says here, 80% of Christian singles admit to premarital sex. An article entitled Almost Everyone's Doing It in Relevant Magazine includes a poll that shows 80% of evangelical singles admit to having premarital sex. What was even more surprising was another poll in the article showed that 65% of women who have abortions in the United States identify themselves as Christian. Isn't that something? <clears throat> the article goes on to, to try and demonstrate why the reason is for such high premarital sexual relationships in Christians, such as the influence from media, we're going to see that in just a minute, Peer pressure and how the average age of people getting married has gone up from the early 20s to the late 20s, and it's just too hard to wait that long. End of the article there. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But let me ask you a question. What's the problem here among today's professing Christian youth? And, you know, I'm not foolish enough, and if you know this ministry, you know that I don't say that all Christians that say they're Christians are saved. You know, in fact, I think the very high majority of them are not saved. I think they're lost. And you see a lot of these pictures of these Christian youth things, even in our area. I mean, we live in a fairly conservative area here, Lancaster County. Even around here, I mean, the, the Christian youth, the way they dress and the way they act, I think, good night. There's no difference between them and the lost. But uh, why is there such a problem with fornication among the professing Christian youth? Well, the number one reason is because they have no warning. They've removed the King James Bible from the hands of the youth. What they replace it with? Well, here I have a brand new 2011 NIV. And we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Here, verse 18. King James Bible says, flee fornication. All right. This thing says, flee from sexual immorality. Boy, that defines it, doesn't it? 
Now you go to these young people and you say, flee from sexual immorality. They'll say, well, let's see, immorality would be, you know, pedophilia, bestiality, maybe sodomy, whatever. But me and my boy, or me and my girlfriend here, we love each other. And it's love. You know, we're just like the adults. We're doing the same thing. It's not immoral for them. So how can it be immoral for us? We're just trying to express our love for one another. See? Now, the Bible word there is fornication. And you shouldn't mess with that word. So there we have the NIV. Whoops. Dropped it on the floor. Have to pick it up later. Or kick it up later, maybe. Here we have the English Standard Version, the ESV. Flee from sexual immorality. What a surprise. <clears throat> the Common English Bible. The one that has Jesuits sitting on the... Uh, Translation Committee, Openly Professing Jesuits. I've done a video about that. Avoid Sexual Immorality. Oh, here's one. This this will get it right. This one here. The New Spirit-Filled Life Bible, New King James Version. This has to be right. I mean, the New King James is just an updated uh, King James Version, right? Flee Sexual Immorality. Hmm. Just like the other junk. The New Revised Standard Version, and this one has the apocryphal books. You know, this is a good one here. Another Harper Collins one. Verse 18, shun fornication. Huh? Shun. shun fornication, yeah, it's not flee it, it's just shun it, you know. Yeah, okay. You know, just, you know, if it's, if it's done, just kind of, you know, hide it, you know. <laughs> shun fornication. You say, oh, wow, you know, that one gets it right. Oh, wonderful, we have a new version that gets it right. Well, actually, if you look down at the footnote, it says, Fornicators are persons who engage in sexual conduct regarded as immoral. So even they go down to the footnote to, to well, what's fornication mean? It doesn't give you the Webster's 1828 diction, or dictionary definition. It just gives you the definition that all the other new versions use. It's sexual immorality. Doesn't help. Down onto the trash heap. How about the, the message remixed? This is the newest message that they came out with. You know, they got to they got to revise these pieces of junk, you know, to keep the sales up, you know. You have the old message that came out back whenever it was and you know, I I don't need another new one. Oh, they came out with the remix. Now I need another one. Yeah. This one's really clear. You're going to love this one. We must not pursue the kind of sex that avoids commitment and intimacy, leaving us more lonely than ever, the kind of sex that can never become one. Boy, that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. To the trash heap. How about the word on the street with Rob Lacey? <clears throat> God's new HQ. You. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. Sort your sex lives. All the rest of your mess doesn't get into your bones like a dodgy sex life does. It eats away at you like nothing else. Haven't you caught on? Your body is God's new HQ. His Holy Spirit lives in you. Permanent contract. You don't own you anymore. God's paid out well over the asking price and he owns the freehold. So if you respect God, then respect yourself. God's your long-term lodger. Direct answers to their previous email. Top of the list. Sex including singleness and sexual frustration, marriage, divorce, remarriage, mixed marriages, i.e. member, non-member, virginity. His answer Basically, don't waste time. Focus on God's stuff. There. That one, you know, I should put it in the stove over there. And by the way, that guy that wrote that, Rob Lacey, a Christian rock guy, you know, working with youth, died of cancer in his 30s. God has a way of taking certain people out quickly. Just incredible. You wouldn't believe the, the wicked vile filth that's in that thing. I mean, it's just disgusting. It's hard to even look at it. But anyhow, so you say, why is there so much fornication among the youth? Because the warning has been taken away from them. They don't have a Bible anymore that says flee fornication. Run from it. Don't even touch a woman. They don't have that. I'm going to show you another problem here. How about Christian youth pool parties? 
I got on YouTube and just thought, oh, I wonder what will happen. I typed in Christian Youth Pool Party. And it came up with this invitation. This big modern church was putting out an invitation, you know. Here's the description for the video. Quote, A Christian pool party. We are here to have fun and glorify God's name. Our God is a fun God, not boring. We're going to have live performance by recognize, recognize uh, Sirius and Danny X. Well, Danny X is my favorite. You know, I just have everything he's ever done. I don't even know who Danny X is. <laughs> Here's what they say about them. Men of God that will be exalting God that night and also music that will please our ears. For more info, call, and then he has his number there. Ask for Enrique. God bless. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 3-4 through 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. The music will please our ears. Hmm. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Isn't that something? It's amazing. A lot of times these modern Christians will actually fulfill Scripture and they don't even realize they're doing it. You know? We, we, we want things that are, that are pleasing to our ears. You know? And it's like you just fulfilled a, a prophecy about the last days. Incredible. What about Christian rock? Christian rock and roll. They go to these modern churches, these, these Christian youth, you know, professing Christian youth. They're using new versions that remove the warnings. Then they go and they have pool parties where it's flesh, you know. And they, and they encourage games where they're, you know, coming in contact with each other. You know, the girl gets up on top of the guy's shoulders and stuff like that. She's got a bikini on. He's got just trunks on. You know, that's a real good idea. But how about Christian rock? Let's, let's add Christian rock to the mix. They're there with their new versions. They're there in their swimsuits. And now let's play some, some fine Christian rock music here. This is, the artist is Blessed Be a Broken Heart. Boy, that sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Album is Pedal to the Metal. And the song is Move Your Body. Here's the lyrics. We come to rock your town to show you what it's like to get down. So turn up, step up, move your body right. Show us how it's done before we ride into the night. A little bit of reference there. Rocking this hard never felt so good, so rock your body right rock excuse me, so rock your body right like you know you should. Throw your hands up into the air and wave them all around like you just don't care. No control over your flesh, in other words. Whoa, keep move keep move your bodies to the rhythm of the beat. Whoa, keep your bodies moving, keep your bodies grooving. Move your body, move, move your body. School's out and it's time to party. Move your body, move, move your body. We got rock, we don't need your money. Throw your hands up and weigh them like you just don't care. Do the robot like you were made with Cylon hardware. Throw your hands up and weigh them like you just don't care. Do the robot, come on. Let me see you throw your hands up in the air. Move to the music, groove, you can do it. Gee, that's spiritual. We should have sang that one this morning. I mean, I feel kind of bad, you know. Standing on the promises and, and uh, leaning on the everlasting arms. I mean, that's kind of outdated, you know. And see, I know how Christian youth are. They'll, they'll you know, a parent might hear that and they'll say, you're not listening to that garbage. Oh, but, but you know, they're called blessed be a broken heart. They're strong Christians. Uh-huh. I know how they talk. I used to do the same thing. You know, I don't listen to the lyrics. You know, I just listen to the music. Uh, yeah, uh-huh. So you have the combination of the three things. New versions that have no Holy Spirit in them. The Holy Spirit of God is not in the pages of these new versions. That junk down there on the floor. He's not in them. So He's not going to bear witness. He's not going to lead them into all truth. Right? They're man-made books. And there's even worse than that. I think there's demons in them. So they have that. Then they have pool parties. And even in, in the professing churches, you ought to see the way some of these youth dress. It's incredible. I mean, I, I've, I've gone to some of these modern churches and stuff. You'll see girls in mini skirts, skin tight pants, low cut tops. We even have one in this area here that had a, low, a girl with a low cut top on as part of the advertisement for their church. You know? And you get around that kind of thing, you're in that atmosphere, and you're going to live a holy, pure life, not going to be tempted to, to fornicate. I don't believe it. And how about uh, the CCM and rock and roll like we just read, the lyrics? Hmm. Christian youth don't stand a chance, do they? 
No. You put yourself in all those areas of temptation and you say, try to make it through. You know, it's kind of like a, a putting a celibate priest, you know, the Catholics, they do this. They put them into the confessional booth and they say, now, you have to force the, the women to tell everything that they do, including intimate de details of their married, married life. And stay pure. You have to be celibate. You can't do it. Especially because these Catholic priests aren't even saved. You know, and you get a lot of these Christian youth that are unsaved, and you throw them into that that mix there of of passion and lust, and you say, "Now don't fornicate, no no premarital sex." Oh, eighty percent are doing it. I wonder why. <laughs> it's obvious why. Now we're going to continue here. Three there are three types of sexual relationships in the Bible. Okay, you have intimacy within the confines of marriage. That is good. Bible talks about that the marriage bed is honorable and undefiled. All right, God has created marriage, and that relationship is for marriage. The second type is fornication outside of marriage, and that's bad. The third type is going after strange flesh. It's no longer a man and a woman. It's now man and man, woman and woman, man or woman and animal, or and then you have the angels and stuff like that like back in genesis chapter 6 it was going on so that's considered strange flesh obviously that's the worst of the three and don't be tempted if you're listening to this and you're involved in fornication to say well at least i'm not you know going after strange flesh so i'm not that bad no you're still very bad okay fornicators are going to be judged by god now let's look at biblical marriage i want to show you something interesting here go back to the very beginning we're going to see the very first married couple <clears throat> Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 is where we're going to start here with this part of the sermon. And if you go, you know, if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, we aren't going to start there, but go back to Genesis chapter 2. God gives Eve to Adam to be his helpmate. And you have there the fall and everything. And Genesis chapter 4 shows up. And it says here, And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now your King James Bible is designed so that it does not offend little children. You know, Jesus Christ said, you know, Suffer the little children to come unto me and, and, you know, and, and offend them not, essentially. So when your Bible is written, it's written that an adult can read it and know what, knew his wife means but a child can read that and they just kind of go you know i don't know what that you know they all oh, they they know them you know yeah. they don't quite understand you know you'll understand when you get older that whole thing okay the message a lot of times has replaced knew his wife with had sex with her the word sex has been added you know thousands of times into the message translation the word sex doesn't appear in your king james bible I'm using it today just to describe what's going on, you know, because people have departed from biblical language. But the the fact is, knew his wife there. That's what it's talking about. Okay. Now, did you see any kind of a marriage ceremony before that happened? No. You didn't see Eve coming down the aisle in a white dress, you know, and they played on the organ, the marriage thing and all that stuff. And, you know, they had the ring bearer and, you know, flower girl come up you know. You didn't see any of that there. <coughs> what about the next marriage? Jump down to verse 16. Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. And Cain went out and Cain, excuse me, and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Let me just state real quick here that this Enoch is not the same Enoch that walked with God. Okay, over in Genesis 5, verse uh, 22. Not the same Enoch. All right, this is a different one. But you see there again that there's no marriage ceremony. It's just this thing of flesh joining flesh. You say, well, good, then, you know, then we can, if we're going to get married eventually, then we can just, you know, come together and sleep together and then we'll, you know, no, I didn't say that. We're going to see here in a little bit about that whole thing. Turn to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis 
Genesis chapter 24. Here you have the story of Isaac and his wife Rebecca. And it, you know, again, we can't go over the whole thing here, but uh, Genesis chapter 24, verses 1 through 4 is where we're going to start out here. Okay, it says, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Now, here you have basically an arranged marriage. And he's saying, I don't want my son to marry with these Canaanites here. I want him to marry somebody from the descendants of Shem. Okay, basically, I can't, again, I can't get into all the details, but he doesn't just say, hey, Isaac, go on out and just have a good time. You know, there's a nice bar down there. I've seen some good looking girls that go there. Go on down and, you know, pick one. He didn't say that. All right, he's arranging a marriage here. Now go back to the back of this chapter. It's a long one. Um, Genesis chapter 24, verse 61. And you go through the whole story there. And the servant goes down and he finds a woman named Rebecca, a young damsel. She's not married. Okay, he goes down there and he finds her. And the Lord says, you know, this is what you're going to find. She'll be there. She'll water the camels and all this stuff. And he, she's there. The, you know, this little prophecy is fulfilled. He gets permission from her family and she comes back with him. But uh, verse 61, And Rebekah arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the well Laharoi, probably butchered that, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. She got down off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Did you see any kind of ceremony in there? Swearing of vows or anything like that? No, it's not in there. And you say, well, the, good then, you know, we can just go out and have fornication and, and then we're married. We don't have to go through any kind of a ceremony or anything. No, not so. Now we're going to go to the book of Ruth. This one's a little bit harder to find. one of those books that you don't go to very often so when you have to find it it's a little bit more difficult Ruth chapter 4 <clears throat> Joshua judges Ruth now here we have a story about a, a young woman that basically married into a Jewish family her husband died, and instead of going back to her own country, she went with her mother-in-law, Naomi, back to, basically, to uh, the land of Israel. But uh, it says here, in uh, Ruth chapter 4, verse 1, Then went Boaz up to the gate, and sat him down there, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz sp uh, spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one! Turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, uh, this is, That is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, uh, But buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the land of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead 
upon his inheritance. Now, you have a lot of things going on there back in Old Testament Israel. Basically, a man was given a plot of land, and that land was his. All right, And if he died, it wasn't just as simple as saying, well, you know, I'm going to go date his wife now, his ex-wife or something, you know, the widow. You Now there was a, a connection. She kind of had the title deed to that land. So if you were going to marry her, you also had to buy the land. All right, so in a sense, you're buying her as well. She's part of the deal. There, what's going on? Now jump down to verse 9. And this guy, you know, he says, I'll buy it. But when Boaz says, you have to also take Ruth, he goes, well, no, actually, I'm not interested. Uh, jump down to verse 9. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead, upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place, ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel, and do thou uh, worthily in Ephrata, and be famous in Bethlehem. And let thy house be like the house of Pharez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. All right, now, what point am I trying to make here? The point I'm trying to make here is he didn't just say, hey, this, this young woman's interested in me and she's really pretty, so I'm going to secretly take her to my house and we're just going to kind of live together, you know, and we'll just kind of consummate the marriage. I'll take her in and I'll know her and then she'll be my wife. He didn't do that. He went and he said, he gathered the elders together and he explained the situation and he said, okay, you guys are witnesses. I want to do right by this woman. And that's what our modern day marriage is supposed to be. You don't just find a girl that, you know, I'm going to marry her and then we'll just kind of sneak off someplace. Uh, -uh. First, you're supposed to go to her father and talk to him and say, man to man, I would like to marry your daughter and here's how I'm going to provide for her. Okay, you have the witness of her father. And then you have the witness of the church. I mean, how would you people feel here today if next week you came and there's some girl hanging all over me? Say, who's this? Well, I'm, I just met her last week. You know, she lives upstairs now with me. Would you accept that? You know, I would certainly hope not. I mean, I think I have to be held a little bit higher standard than that or any Christian, you know? But let me ask you a question. When two teenage youths go off and commit fornication, are they gaining witnesses from people? No. Does that young man go to the father of this young girl that he's dating and say, I'd like to go and know your daughter. I'm going to come in under her and I'm going to know her and she's going to conceive and bear a son. That's okay, right? <laughs> no, of course he doesn't do that. Does he go before the church and say, hey, you know, I'm going to get, I'm going to know this girl here and we're going to have children together. Ah, uh -uh. you know what they do? They sneak off to some apartment that nobody knows about, you know, or they're wait till their parents are away or something. And then they do it in secret. Why? Because it's fornication. It's not, don't take these things in the old Testament. I brought that up because I know how teens are. They'll look for loopholes and they'll look for this stuff. And they'll say, see, there's no marriage ceremony. Well, there might not have been a marriage ceremony in the sense that we have it today, but there's this thing in the Old Testament of you are supposed to have witnesses. And there's a biblical marriage thing, a, a thing, you know, I haven't really studied this a whole lot, but the thing of you can get married without going through all the state licensing thing, and all you need are witnesses. So, you know, that's something you might want to study if you're looking into that. But, you know, I'm not going to get off on that subject today. But the point is, this is not grounds for fornication, what was going on back here in the Old Testament. Don't use it for that. They had a thing of being right before God and before man. And if you're going to have that kind of a relationship, you need to have that same thing. You need to go to the father of the girl. You need to get his permission. And you also need to go before the church and show that we are serious here. We're going to live together as husband and wife. This isn't just a fling here. Now, 
Genesis chapter 12. Turn back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 12, verse 14. We're going to see an interesting case here of a almost a fornication type of a situation. And this is interesting because it wasn't really even his fault. Uh, here you have Abram coming into the land of Egypt and his wife Sarai. This is before they were called Abraham and Sarah. Uh, his wife Sarai is very pretty. And he was worried that you know Pharaoh was going to kill him and take his wife from him. So he just said, hey, just pretend you're my sister. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 14. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt... The Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. A couple of interesting points here. Did Pharaoh try to be honorable? Yeah, he really did. This lost pagan tried to do the honorable thing. Okay? Gave, you know, all kinds of riches to Abram for Sarai. Point number two, marriage is obviously more than just a sexual relationship. Okay? He tried to be do the honorable thing here. You know? The third point I want to make is Pharaoh knew better than to commit adultery even though, and here's interesting, even though the Ten Commandments had not been given yet. Isn't that Interesting. And I've used this argument before, and I'll say it one more time just to make the point. People say, well, the lost world, they can't understand that they're sinners. Oh, yes, they can. <laughs> right there's a guy saying, I was almost guilty of adultery. But wait a second. Thou shalt not commit adultery hadn't been given yet. How did he know? Because God creates it and puts it in your heart. Exactly. He writes the law on your heart. All right? So right there you have a situation that would have been fornication. And fortunately the Lord stepped in there and said no. Matthew chapter 5. Turn to your New Testament. I think, well, we won't be quite there yet. but Matthew chapter 5 verse 31. Now we're going to see the difference here between a single person, two single people coming together and committing fornication. Now you have married. What happens when you have extramarital relations? In other words, you are married, but then you have relations outside that God-ordained marriage. Matthew chapter 5, verse 31. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication causeth her to commit adultery, whosoever shall marry her that is divorced uh, committeth adultery. So can a married couple, or a married person, I should say, married one of the individuals, can they commit fornication? Yes. What's it called when they're married and they commit fornication? Adultery. Yeah. So it's still fornication, but in the, in the context of somebody who's married doing that, it's now called adultery. All right, and if you it says there if you would put away if you're married and you put away your wife and she hasn't you know committed fornication, you really don't have grounds for it other than that. If you put her away and now she goes and she lives with another man, now she's committed adultery. But that sin is now imputed to the man. If the man would just say, "I'm sick and tired of her. I can't stand her. Get out." You know, oh, "Okay, fine, I'll leave." And then she goes and she moves in with some other guy. Now you've caused her to commit adultery, and now it's you know basically your problem. You shouldn't have done that if you're a, a married man. So single people, they commit fornication. 
married people, they do commit fornication, but it's called adultery. Now, the third type there that I mentioned, we had the first type of, of sex, we'll say, and that is between a man and a wife, which is totally fine, totally ordained of God, it's fine. The second type is fornication outside of marriage. We read about that in Genesis chapter 12, verse 14 through 20 with Pharaoh. He would have committed fornication. Actually, in his case, it would have probably been adultery. Um, number three, we have going after strange flesh. I want to show you the interesting thing here. The, the first time God destroyed the whole earth. Genesis chapter 6. Now, we've been over this before, and it's very familiar, but I just want to show you this passage again. Because I want to make some points here. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 9 is what we're going to read. And here we have the third type of sexual relationship in the Bible. And this is the going after strange flesh, like I mentioned before. It says here, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, did they do any kind of sin as far as what they were doing in the fact that they're going and they're taking wives? No, not really. Well, then why was it considered a sin? Because it was strange flesh. See? And you can have two sodomites get together and they can say, well, we're married officially. Doesn't matter. It's strange flesh. It's not what God said. God didn't say, you know, men and men together and women and women together. And, and now, you know, here in America, we have this new law that was passed that uh, people and animals can actually be married. You know, it's disgusting. You know, what was the what's the thing? The military don't ask, don't tell policy was overturned by Obama, you know, so queers can be in there now. And it also in the legislation, in writing, it says that a, a man, a pervert, can bring, well, it doesn't say a pervert, but a man can bring an animal onto the base and be married to it. I'm not making that up. It's in writing, a law protecting a pervert like that. You say, oh, they, you know, they, they, they're doing marriage the right way and they're, you know, confessing it before men. It doesn't matter. It's strange flesh. And here we have these angels coming down, the sons of God. Listen to the angels sermon if you don't know about that. Here we have these sons of God coming down and they are taking wives of these human women. Doesn't matter. It's strange flesh. You can't do what's honorable in God's sight with strange flesh. But let's continue. Verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of, daughter, or sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. All those stories that you hear about, about like Zeus and Hercules and all this stuff. Zeus, you know, mated with a human woman and then they had Hercules and all this. Those are just stories that were passed down from generation to generation. You know, that go back to before the flood. These stories were repeated. Verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Look at your modern day newspaper. It pretty much lines up with that. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. There again, listen to the sermon on the sin of Sodom. And it says that the sin of the, the men of Sodom was very grievous to the Lord. And the Lord looks down here at America and at the, a lot of the other countries out there that are filled with Sodomites. And it's very grievous to him. He doesn't accept it. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Let me just say something else here before I continue. How long did God's wrath last back then? Forty days and forty nights. Okay? You say, oh, the God of the Old Testament was so cruel. He was so mean. How about the God of the Old Testament? How about the God of the New Testament pouring out his wrath and judgment for seven years? That's what's coming in the very, very near future. Why? 
because the same kind of junk is going on today as it went on back then. Verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. He was perfect in his generations, meaning he didn't mess around with strange flesh. So if God was going to start over again with the human race, I'll use that term, God was going to start over again, he had to pick a man that wasn't, didn't have messed up DNA. So he picked Noah and his three sons. Now, we're going to hit a couple more scriptures here and then we'll be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Go back to your New Testament. It's a strange thing when you go through your Bible, you'll see that God gets angry about a lot of different things. Why? Well, because He's God and He makes the rules. But you'll see this thing where God gets very angry, but it's interesting, the one where He starts to destroy and pour out wrath and judgment, when He starts doing that, and we're going to see that here in just a minute, is when it's sexual sin. There's an extra thing there where God really gets mad when it starts to turn into this sex perversion stuff. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now the next couple of verses there, he goes through and he's starting to compare Old Testament things that happened to us today. The things that were written aforetime are written for our learning, Paul says in another place. Okay, what I, why I was going back there to the Old Testament today is because those things that were written that happened to those Jews back in the Old Testament, they can teach you a lot today. Jump down to verse 8. <clears throat> it says here, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Now, <clears throat> I've made this point many times. You know, people think that 9-11 was such a horrible thing. And it was bad. But we're talking 3,000 people died in one day on 9-11. How about 23,000? That's a lot. And what's being described there is <clears throat> when Moses was up in the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments from God, he's coming back down and he hears this loud noise, you know, and he says it sounds like war, kind of like a rock concert does. <laughs> you know? And by the way, I didn't say this earlier. Rock and roll was an, originally a slang term for a young couple in the back seat of a car. You figure it out. All right? So you say, you know, man, rock and roll. Yeah, you know what you're saying? You're saying sex. You're saying fornication. And how many young youth groups, that's a big thing, you know. Man, you know, I can't wait. I actually heard a youth, the one time Christian youth, I can't wait to get to heaven. We're going to rock and roll for all of eternity. It's like, you don't even realize what you're saying. You're saying, you know, we're going to fornicate for all of eternity. That's what rock and roll originally meant. But what happened here, Moses is up in the, in the mountains. He gets the Ten Commandments. He's coming back down and he hears this wild party. They had taken all their gold and they melted it into this big golden calf. And they're worshiping it and they were fornicating. There was fornication. It was a lewd party, okay, that was going on. And Moses comes down and he takes the Ten Commandments and he smashes them on the ground and he says, okay, who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And a lot of the people didn't come. They wanted to have their sin. And so what happened? They were killed. They were slaughtered. God does not like sexual sin. And when a, when a nation becomes sexually depraved and there's fornication, there's sodomy, there's bestiality, there's all this other stuff, and I guarantee you, if angels showed up, there would be lines of women waiting to be with them. I guarantee it. There's, it's, it's in Hollywood movies. Again, in the angels' study. They have made movies about, isn't this beautiful that this angel from heaven came down and he gave up his, his immortality to be with this woman so he could fornicate with her. It's in Hollywood movies. It's a theme in Hollywood. Oh, this is so neat. Oh, it's so wonderful. And there's, you know, what's the most popular thing today? vampires, you know, werewolves, all this other stuff. Mortal people making love to immortal creatures. That's what's going on. You say, do you think that stuff's going to come back? Yes, I do. 
Yeah, I really do. I think in the tribulation especially, you're going to see that stuff in abundance. I think it's going to get real bad. But uh, <clears throat> we'll continue here. Verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Those things that were written back in the Old Testament are for our learning, to admonish us. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Go back towards the back of your Bible, a couple books over. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. It says here, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Now I've been over this before. They're manifest meaning that you can see them. This stuff is always going to be in abundance. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do such things. It does not say those who have done these things. All right? And it's kind of funny because a lot of the conservative Baptist brethren, you know, and I'll kick them because they're one of the few churches that are left <laughs> that are, you know, even any good. But a lot of them, verses 19 and 20, they'll say, I got those, you know, I don't have a problem there. Well, the first part of 20. But then you hit emulation. You know what emulation is? It's when you put somebody up on a pedestal and you say, oh, brother so-and-so, he's such a wonderful man. You know, the reverend doctor. PhD, THD, THM. Mm -hmm. That's emulation. The lust of the flesh. Okay? How about wrath, strife, seditions, heresies? A lot of the conservative Christian brethren, they aren't guilty of fornication or adultery or idolatry or things like that, but they'll be guilty of those sins right there. And what goes? what happens? What's the result of that? Well, they don't inherit the kingdom of God. And Romans chapter 14, verse 17, we won't turn there for sake of time, but it says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You cannot live after the flesh and expect to have a great relationship with God. It's not going to happen. Go next to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> okay, it says here, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks, for this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. You see it there again. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is specifically a reference to that millennial kingdom. Verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things, the list that we just went through, cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience, the lost world. Look at verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Well, I'm saved. I can fornicate and get away with it. Oh, no, you can't. When you start to mess around with the flesh, God will punish a saved Christian sometimes even harder than he will a lost person. Continuing, verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So you see it there again. Uh, but it's interesting there. It says about that you're not to even talk about that stuff. You know, let it not be once named among you. How many young people do you know that, that fornicate and then keep their mouth shut about it? <laughs> they talk about it. Among the guys, they brag about it. Among the girls, they kind of, you won't believe what I, you know. Uh-huh. You can't get away with it. You can't get get 
away with this thing of fornicating. One more place to turn to and then we're done for this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Keep turning towards the back of your Bible and you'll hit it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. We'll read that and then we'll be done. Okay, it says here, Furthermore, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Commandments. You say, well, I'm glad we're not under the commandments and under the law anymore. Oh, I don't think so. You're not under those things to be saved, but there are still commandments that you have as a Christian. There are still things we have liberty, yes, but you are still there are still commandments. The Lord says, "Don't do this." That's a command. Continuing, verse three: For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Concupiscence. What's that? Well, the definition is unlawful or irregular desire of sexual pleasure. Basically, fornication. Verse 6, That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. God is the avenger. He will actually be after you if you start messing around with, with fornication. Verse 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. I'll get back to that in a minute. Well, no, I'll just say it now because I'm going to finish up with verse 8. The Lord gives us wisdom. Okay? And a lot of people try to use this thing of if I believe it, I can receive it. You know, I can, I, if I just trust, if I just pray hard enough. The Lord can work miracles, but the Lord also gives you common sense. I'll give you an example. If you go out and you, you, stand in raw sewage up to your waist and you say, Lord, please keep me healthy. Well, get out of the sewage. Well, I believe the Lord can keep me healthy standing here in this raw sewage. Well, He gives you enough wisdom to get out of that. All right. If you live on a consistent diet of soda and white sugar, we'll just say just that's all you eat, and you say, God, please keep me healthy, well, it's not going to happen. If you live after the flesh, you will die, the Bible says. Don't think that you can continue living in fornication and just live a perpetual life of sin and lust and say, you know, God's just going to preserve me and I'll just be all right. It's not going to happen. God can work miracles, but He also works with the laws of science when it comes to flesh. There are certain things that you have to be proactive about. You have to take action. You have to eat healthy. You have to live healthy. You have to stay in good shape physically. God isn't just going to say, here, I'll give you good health uh, even though you want to live according to your, your fleshly desires. It isn't going to happen. Hey, I'm going to give you a pure life, but you can continue listening to rock music and continue continue reading new versions and you can continue having contact with the flesh, but I'll give you a pure mind. It's not going to happen. And I'm I am very glad, you know, I've been I've been ripping on youth a lot, but I'll tell you right now, there are some discerning youth out there. And I've had some of them contact me at this ministry here, you know, and I, man, it just it, I I love to hear from the youth. Kids in high school and everything. I had it's kind of funny, I'll tell this little story here. Um I had a Christian youth up in Canada that it was listening to watching my videos, listening to the sermons. And he started posting videos on YouTube making fun of his pastor. And he's like, I learned more from one of Brian Denlinger's sermons than 10 of my pastor's sermons. And the parents of this young man wanted to join this church. And the pastor found out about this YouTube channel. And he said, before I give you membership, I want your son's YouTube account closed. <laughs> and they forced him to close his channel because they want to be members of this church, you know. You know, some big old dead church someplace. You know, and you know, I, I don't want the, the thing of like, um, put me up on a pedestal or something like that. 
But the point is, I've, I know what it's like to be in a dead church. You know, I understand that. I understand what the young guy was trying to say. But I love to hear from, from youth, from teenagers. And there are a lot of them out there that see the corruption. And they see this thing of the fornication that goes on. There was fornication going on when I was a, a teenager at the church I grew up in. An independent Bible church, fundamentalist Bible church. There was fornication going on. And there were youth that would say, you know, well, if we love each other, can't, you know, can't we be together and all this stuff? You know, they're trying to justify themselves. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Back in the 1980s. You know, quite a few years ago. You know, I realize some of the teens out there that listen are probably like, you know, I wasn't even alive back then. <laughs> you know, I'm getting old. But uh, the fact is, you cannot live in fornication. You cannot live with this steady diet of rock music and new versions and flesh and movies and things like that, looking at immodest women and stuff and, and sex scenes, R-rated movies and all this. You can't live that kind of a life and expect to please God. Now, if you say, well, I heard this sermon, I'm very highly offended. You know, I, I'm, I'm very mad. Well, look at verse 8. Here's where we're going to close. He there therefore that despiseth, despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. When you hear a preacher preach, you check him out against the Scripture. And if what he's saying lines up with Scripture, then if you're mad, it's your problem. What I have said this morning lines up with the King James Bible. You want to find justification for your sin? Go with one of the garbage new versions. They won't judge you for your fornication. There's a loophole there. You can use that. But if you want to be a Bible-believing Christian, you want to live in sanctification and honor and be pleasing in God's sight, and you really truly want to be saved, you cannot live in fornication. And if you're offended, don't be offended at me. Because I'm just a preacher. I'm preaching what's in this book. Take it up with God. So that's going to be it for this morning. I'm going to close out here in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank You for Your Word, for your, the commandments that You give us. Lord, I just pray that if there are any youth listening to this, that they would flee fornication, as Your Word says, and the things that lead to fornication, Lord. I pray that if they would get engaged or start courting, that they would abstain from even touching one another, Lord. That they would be willing to wait uh, for those intimate relationships that come after marriage. I pray that they would be honorable in the sight of man and God and that they would not sneak off someplace and let their passions take over and their lust take over and commit this sin of fornication. And Lord, for those out there that, that are listening to this and that have committed fornication in their past, I pray, Lord, that the, that the guilt that they feel uh, would would manifest into a repentant spirit and that they would ask for your forgiveness, that they would confess that sin of fornication and they would ask for your forgiveness and that they would not commit it anymore, but they would recommit their life to, to serving you and um, from here on out live a, a know how to possess their vessel, the body that you've given them, in sanctification and honor and how to live a holy clean life and to abstain from the things that lead to fornication like the new versions and the rock music and the immodest dress standards. I pray, Lord, that they would flee from those things. And so I just ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's it. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.